Welcome to the Wizards Brew Podcast. I'm Carl John. And I'm Daniel Nyhuis. So, we just finished up with the Pro Tour last weekend. Um, kind of went a little bit like we were expecting in some ways. Yep. Agro always wins the Pro Tour. Like, always. And, um... I don't know, that, that's something to be told, though. Like, if you're going to be going to a Pro Tour, if you're going to a major event, Aggro's not a bad option in a unknown metagame. Yeah, Aggro usually has a solid game plan. I mean, we've seen Aggro win so many Pro Tours, but I think the biggest thing that some people were surprised about, but uh, I wasn't, and I don't think you were either, Danny, is Mardu Vehicles performing so poorly in the Pro Tour compared to the previous weekend. Well, it wasn't that they were performing poorly. It's more of that the pilots aren't good in draft, and that's why the Pro Tour is so different. Um, if it was constructed, oh, I bet Marty probably would have made it in the top eight, honestly. It is possible. Um, but I think one thing to consider as well is compared to uh, the two front runners of the new standard format, Etherworks Marvel and Zombies, Mardu vehicles had very few lists that made it outside X and four. We saw uh, a like a handful of seven and three lists, and I think only two lists that went better than that. So uh, it's it's a little bit of a tough world for vehicles, but mostly that's because after the weekend before, uh, vehicles had a bit of a target on its back. Everyone knew it was going to be a big player in the format, so everyone came prepared for it. That's very true, though. Like it, it when you're Talking about, like, the aggro deck to play, and it's been known for, you know, six months to a year now, like, it just becomes difficult to play that deck and do well. Yeah, when everyone knows what your deck is going to be doing once they see turn one Thraven Inspector, it's uh, pretty tough to play around uh your opponent like your opponent just knows what's going to be coming out of you turn two three four five like it, it's pretty straightforward what vehicles does so everyone's kind of figured it out by now so everyone's figured out how to play against it exactly there's a lot of options too now which is great honestly yeah and sadly we didn't see a whole lot of innovation in vehicles like we were saying last week there has not been a lot of innovation in the list, and it's possible that there isn't much room for it. The list may be pretty solid as it is, but uh, I mean the the most the most innovative list that we saw was uh, there was one list that went super aggro. It was kind of the veteran motorist build, uh, you know, four veteran motorists, two PNLR, some inventors apprentices, but it was including reckless bushwhacker to really try and you know win the game as fast as possible against decks like Otherworks Marvel. Yeah, it Bushwhacker seemed like a decent tech card. Yeah, it is very interesting to see that. Um now this guy he he went seven and three, so he would have been in top eight contention if he had done well in the draft pro- portion. But this is one of the things about the Pro Tour is it's not just about standard. It is about your draft performance as well. So you need to be a good player in both formats to do to you know get into the top eight and potentially win, and that's why we we usually end up seeing you know the the same couple of faces rotating around in the top eight. It's it's these guys who are just good all around players. Yeah, and that's a big thing about the Pro Tour. The being all well rounded is better than being strictly good at something. Hence, why I actually don't really want to go to the Pro Tour because limited is my worst format. <laughs> Yeah, I I love limited though, so I would love to get a chance at the Pro Tour. I think that I would probably um, end up bringing something too janky for standard, though. Uh, you know me. I mean, at the same time though, I probably I, I probably could convince you to play like the tier deck and be like, "All right, man, this is what you gotta do. Have fun." Yeah, maybe. Now, I I think one of the coolest things we saw at the Pro Tour, and uh, they gave this deck a uh, nice little. Uh, they gave this deck some time. Uh, on camera, you know, with the deck tech and everything, was a Sultai Etherworks Marvel list. Now, uh, last week for our Brew of the Day, we went over Abzan Etherworks with the potential to uh, get Delirium for Ishkanaz in the sideboard, but this was playing the Ishkanaz main board. It was really going all in on the 
Delirium with Vessel of Nascencies and everything. And then it played Demon of Dark Schemes. This was such a such a cool deck. It really was. I, I like Demon of Dark Schemes. I think that card is really, really powerful. Is it too slow? Maybe. Maybe, but it, it was a nice tech choice against um, against vehicles because it kills a lot of their things, gets you a lot of energy, and then it kills a good number of early zombies as well. So it, it was really cool to see that. And using Liliana Death's Majesty to get back an Ulamok that you threw in the yard with Vessel of Nascency or something. Like, there are some really cool lines you could do with this deck. Um, I'm excited to see how this deck does in the future. And, um, you know, r- just really cool. Exactly. It, it's very, very cool. It actually uh, got me to put together a really, really janky uh, five-color Etherworks list on Mitgo. Uh, we're not going to talk about that this week, but uh, if I get it a bit more refined, maybe. Yeah, it's... <laughs> it's what you expect. <laughs> if you guys it's five-color been... stuff. Yeah, it's, it's just five-color good stuff with Etherworks Marvel to play it. it it's great. Um but we're we're going to move on to some really interesting news that came out this week, uh, and actually has been stewing for a while. There's been talk about the core set possibly returning. We know that they got rid of the core set after Magic Origins. That was the last core set that we had, you know, a place to reprint, the, you know, for mostly reprints, but to kind of set the stage for where Standard was going to go. And uh, a while back, there was a survey that went out. Asking players, oh, if we were to bring back core sets, what do you think it should be called? I, I don't remember some of the examples that they have, but now the, they've released new set logos, and there's one for a set that they are tentatively calling 25, where it's the Planeswalker symbol with a 25 etched into it. I think this is extremely important for Magic. Yeah, like getting, the core, set, getting the core sets back would be... Um, a really nice uh, w- would be really nice for the balance of standard. And um, for those of you who may be confused about the twenty five, that is referring to the twenty fifth anniversary of Magic: The Gathering. But um, one thing that I really uh, think is great about the core sets is that was always where we got our answer cards. We always got our naturalize and our disenchant and all of that stuff out of the core sets, and maybe we got like a few. Um, a few like rares here and there that would uh, you know hint at some strategies that are going to come out of the next sets, or maybe that would help back up some of those strategies. But really, it was those answer cards that uh, that everyone was always excited to find in those core sets, as, at least you know the competitive players. Yeah, like don't get me wrong, core sets were they're not fun to draft. They're really not, but they're necessary. Oh God, are they necessary? For the format, um, hey, hey especially now. for standard. Hey, now M thirteen was a pretty fun draft <clears throat> format. Let's let's be honest here. Well, I didn't play during M thirteen. I was actually M fourteen when I came in. <laughs> well, you missed it. it. It was a really good one. Um, but yes, uh, core sets have historically not always been the most fun to draft. But one thing I really hope that they do, and this would be a really great idea, is uh, looking at other card games, Hearthstone. Hearthstone recently ran into the issue of, you know, we've got too many cards available for decks, so they split up their uh, game into the two formats of Wild, which is basically their version, their legacy, and Standard, which is their, well, Standard. So, one thing that they that they made, that they built into, the, that they built into it, is that the original set of cards is available in every single standard, except for maybe a handful that they say, okay, this handful of cards is too powerful for standard right now or doesn't work with what is in standard, so we're going to ban these from standard for the time being. Mm -hmm. And I hope Wizards kind of takes some inspiration from this, and instead of having core sets be one of these seasonal sets, you end up with the core sets being separate. Kind of like we've been seeing with the uh, starter decks or beginner decks recently that are reprinting Sarah Angel and Nightmare and stuff like that, you know, these these older cards, but they're still legal in standard. So we end up with 
these answer cards being printed in these being printed in this core set that is separate uh, but still legal and standard you know something like that yeah i could see i could see that being a thing where um court god man i don't i don't even know where to start honestly because core sets were just so important for the format um it really it it had answers that you just don't want to print in normal formats. Kind of like how we're getting negate in almost every single <laughs> block now. And and that that's fine. That's okay, but that negate could be a different card. You know what I mean? Like little things like that, naturalize a spell, erase, uh, you know, things like that, they all add up over time. Reclamation stage, dear god, that would be amazing. You know, little little nuances be really really nice and then bringing other stuff back from older formats you know not affinity for example but convoke was a decent mechanic how did having quarter calling was also not bad like now now that we have um now that we have a mind sensor quarter calling wouldn't be bad to have a reprint or hell just any form of a tutor effect we only get those in core sets though yeah i mean th- those sorts of things were traditionally printed in core sets and taking inspiration from Hearthstone and just having it separate from the main sets. You know, just having this uh, you know, pool of cards that you can decide the, this pool of cards are always legal and standard and then you tweak it here and there every year. Uh, that would, you know, prevent them from having to print these cards in limited because we have heard stories from R&D about oh, well, we wanted to add this card in but it didn't work in the limited format so we had to cut it. Like, uh, Thoughtseize, for instance. Thoughtseize kind of just sat around in R&D's back pocket for the longest time because after Lorwyn, they could not find a limited format where they wanted to have Thoughtseize until Theros came around. And even then, they didn't want Thoughtseize there. Yeah, even then, they didn't want it. They were kind of forced into putting Thoughtseize into Theros because it had been so long since it had been printed. And it, it eventually, it ended up being for the worse for standard because it ended up at a bad time where we ended up with um with mono black devotion being a deck with pack rats and stuff and it was the just horror. kind of a bad time for it to be there it really was and the thing is it, it i get it it's hard for wizards i mean it's so hard for them that they actually have to develop a new team where they have to have a play group of people, so that way stuff doesn't get leaked through the cracks, you know, i.e. Re- uh, Reflector Mage um, and the Sahili combo. Like, these things are something that, you know, fell through the cracks big time. Big, flopping mistakes from Wizards. And they're just like, oh, well, we can't do anything about it. And then finally they're like, well, we gotta go to a... We gotta go back to banning. And Wizards doesn't want to do that. That That's something that they don't want to do. You know, that's why they're so hesitant to make bans. And, like, as you saw with the Sahili Ride combo and and Cat, they didn't ban it the first week. They banned it after they were basically told you were wrong and you need to ban this card. So they don't want to ban. They want to make the mistakes correct, except that they made a horrible mistake by making a two-block format with no core set and also not rotating them fast enough either. So cards that shouldn't be in the format are in the format, and it's getting weird now. Yeah, and, and you make a good point um, about the uh, the new playtesting team that they have for R and D. Um, that's going to be a huge boon for them. They're they're getting former pros, uh, including you know Melissa Datora, um, a very decorated pro. She she had a great competitive career um, on this team. That their whole goal in R&D is to take the cards that are co- that are going to be in the next set and break them as hard as they can, you know, so they can catch stuff like Emrakul, The Promised End, or Sahili Rai and Felidar Guardian earlier and be able to adjust these cards before they go to release. I, I mean, I'm, I'm super excited for the first set that comes out after this team has gotten their hands on it. I'm super excited for how that set is going to turn out. They're they're actually gonna be well, they're gonna be looking at cards and going all right this is competitive you know there's a lot of formats especially like right now limited isn't fun it, it's it's very like 
oh, this is the deck you got to play, otherwise you're losing. You know, there's no there's no branching. It's it's very strict, and that's not the way limited used to be, or it should be. Yeah, I think the last uh, great limited format we had, in my opinion, was triple cons of Tarkir because you were able to, uh, like, like you were able to branch strategies because, uh, and, and in that for and in that format, it was because of the color fixing and the morphs that you were able to do that, and hopefully they can come up with uh, mechanics or themes that are going to make, uh, kind of like halfway through the draft, you can do like an like pivot into another strategy and still be able to use your cards easily who knows but uh we're gonna move on from the news i think we've talked a little bit uh i think we've talked enough about news and we're gonna talk about uh what we promised from last week the other half of the almond cat meta so we're gonna be talking about the new decks that have come out uh f- you know that the, that the cards from almond cat have allowed to flourish yeah, um, I mean, just to kind of start it off, Black X Zombies, like, who knew? Yeah, yeah Zombies. Uh, zombies is here. Zombies is doing really well. I mean, we saw in the top eight, it won the Pro Tour, uh, and it's a very powerful deck. I mean, it has very aggressive starts. You have Dread Wanderer, a one mana 2-1. I mean, I've said it before and I'll say it again, Pikers are good cards, doesn't matter what mm-hmm. doesn't matter if they have downsides and if they have upsides like Dread Wanderer does, they're just great because Dread Wanderer late game just keeps coming back. It's just a recurring two power threat. Card's great. Yeah, card's card's really great. Uh definitely deserving of the uh rare rarity that it has. Then we have Relentless Dead, a card that everyone was super excited about when it got printed and it kind of flopped, now making a comeback. This card really is it's a tough card to play like you don't just place it in any deck that you want because it's it's a synergy card it's not a lord but it's zombie loved so for a while you know like you could build a zombie deck it just didn't have that umph that it needed it really needed that last little push in order to make itself stand out um you know, two mana, two two. It, it's fine. Double black. That's hard to cast. Uh, it's got menace. Sure, that's okay. But the big upside of it is when it dies, you can spend, you know, convert a mana cost or whatever you want and get a card back. That's a big deal. Yeah, it's a really big deal, especially because you've got some high power uh, threats and zombies to get back with, with Relentless Dead. We'll be going over those in just a minute. But, um, I mean, this card, as you said. It, you can't throw it into any deck, and that's kind of the thing that people were trying to do in this when it came out. It, it everyone saw, oh, it's a two mana two two with menace that can come back to my hand. That is great, except that it's black black to pay it to play it, and then black to return it to your hand when it dies. That you have to be very heavy into black, which thankfully mono black zombies can do, and that's the version that is playing relentless dead. Um, just to consistently play this guy in turn two get him back to your hand easily, and then occasionally you just get back something like Diagraph Colossus. Another card that, uh, from the sa- from right around the same time as Relentless Dead, uh, Diagraph Colossus, really popular among Kitchen Table and Commander players, and now you can play a 3-mana 7-7 seven, seven in Standard easily because it enters with a number of plus plus encounters equal to the zombies in your graveyard. So late game, your relentless deads become nine nines by, by bringing back Diagraph Colossus when they die. Yeah. I mean, it really Diagraph Colossus is insane, but like really the cards that just kind of put it all together, like let's, let's not, let's not like talk about like the silly things. Liliana's mastery really pushed this deck and same with the Lord, the, um, Accursed, whatever it was called. Yeah, Lord of the Accursed, yeah. Or Accursed Lord, yeah. That guy. (laughs) Those two cards. uh, Super powerful for the deck because one of the downsides to playing a go-wide token tribal deck like this uh, usually is board wipes. Uh, But right now, uh, most people are playing damage-based board wipes like Radiant Flames and Sweltering Suns and Calls Lex Return. 
But then Liliana's Mastery makes all your zombies 3 threes. Lord of the Accursed makes all your zombies 3 threes. Slap them together. Or you play multiples of each. You're now having 4-4s, four 5-5s, four, five and so on. And it just really adds to the resiliency and power of the deck. I mean, one turn you, you think you dealt with their board. The next turn, you're facing down a giant board of four fours that uh you you just used your board wipe and you can't you can't find another one it, like they help out a lot with uh just the staying power of the deck against a lot of against against a lot of the removal out there yeah i mean the, liliana's mastery man like five mana makes six power holy crap mm-hmm. lord of the curse also like does a lot of work like oh you know make your creatures menace all yeah dude like i i think people forgot how powerful lords were Lord, Lord effects, like rally effects, are just so freaking good. <laughs> yeah, we haven't really had a good Lord for a while, and this guy, uh, he's giving some, he, he's giving some flashbacks to Lord to Lorwyn Block and uh, some of its lords uh, right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we've also got some other cards. We got Crypt Breaker is actually a really good role player in the deck. Um, Crypt Breaker helps you out in two different ways. You can make extra tokens out of your extra lands so you know you keep drawing your swamps you make it into a zombie in the same way you could use him in limited but then when you're in a position where your board isn't really getting anywhere you just start drawing cards and we actually saw this in the finals with jerry thompson piloting it there were a lot of turns where he could have swung in for you know three or four damage but instead he's like i'm gonna draw a card i'm gonna draw a card i'm gonna draw a card and he just destroyed his opponent in card advantage Mm -hmm. exactly it's the card advantage that you get from that is just insane like it it's very reminiscent of uh underworld connections Mm, yes underworld connections uh it is you know paying life to draw cards and you, you you get one every turn but it's it's a nice payoff like especially because against the aggressive against aggressive decks you can still you know have blockers you declare your blocks and then okay i'm gonna draw a card Next turn, I'm going to make more zombies. Pass. They go to attack. I'm going to block. I'm going to draw a card. I'm going to draw two cards this turn. <laughs> like, and the fact that it's also you know a one mana card. It's like oh, turn one, turn two, turn three. Yeah, nice little curve. Turns everything on really easily. Now we saw um, two different versions of zombies at the Pro Tour. We saw the mono black zombies, and then we also saw black white zombies, and this allowed them to splash for. Uh, wayward servants which get which gives the deck a lot of reach every single zombie drains your opponent for one you know Liliana, Liliana's mastery drains your opponent for two uh diagraph colossus whenever a zo- whenever you cast a zombie you get another one so cast a zombie get another one that's drained for two you have two diagraph colossuses on board or colossi whatever play a zombie Colossism. drain for three like Wayward Servant gives a lot of uh, reach and resiliency to the deck by padding your life total. Then you've got your Anguish Unmakings, and then you even have Gideons that you can play in the sideboard just to really yeah. uh, really give your opponent a lot of threats to have to deal with. Yay, Gideon. No, but seriously, <laughs> the, the white that you can play, you can just splash in the deck is so good. And then you also get the, you also get the creature lanes, too. Yeah, you get the Shambling Vents. Shambling Vents is still a very powerful card. Yeah, it, it's... There's a lot of good stuff in this deck, and... <clears throat> I don't know. I just have a... I'm, I'm just impressed that the... I'm just impressed that the deck is actually doing this well. And also existing way after the zombie block is gone. Like... Shadows over Innistrad, that was zombies, all about the zombies and stuff. What happened, you know? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, like, somehow the zombies that came out in this set are doing better than the zombies that came out in the zombie set. I mean, you could argue mummies, zombies, but uh, flavor-wise, Innistrad was the plane for zombies. Uh, Mm -hmm. Yeah. Who knows? Um... So we're going to move on from zombies. There's a few other ways you can take it, you know, playing some other colors, but uh, we may get into that in another episode. For now, uh, we're going to move on to the next deck we want to talk about. We already have talked about it uh, in a previous episode, and this is the New Perspectives Combo deck. So uh, I bought this deck on MTGO. 
It was less than $100 when I bought it. And this deck is really crazy fun. Um, it's a combo deck that actually allows you to use Approach of the Second Sun. Um, but the main thing is the deck has um, twiddle effects. Well, with the, I think it's... The Vizier of Tumbling called? Sands, right? That guy? Yeah, Vizier of Tumbling Sands. Um, that's a twiddle on a stick, which is really nice. Well, so what you start doing is you have uh, Weirding Woods as a three of in the deck, so that way you attach it to your land. You know, Approach allows you to, you know, cycle for free. And you start twiddling and generating a bunch of mana, and you just cycle through your deck. So Shadow of the Grave just, like, allows you to redo it again. So you can kind of go soft off. You're like, okay, uh, new perspectives, uh, untap two of my lands because I, you know, twiddle two creatures. You know, combo through as much as I can. Shadow the Graves, do it again. Shadow the Graves, do it again. Like, and and you just repeat the process. And what you do basically is draw through your entire deck with Approach of the Second Sun. And you just generate and float a bunch of mana while you're tapping and untapping your lands. It's really, really interesting. Um, Hard. It's not hard. It's actually more annoying to play online because it's a, a bunch of clicking. I'm probably doing like, you know, 20 clicks a second. <laughs> 20 clicks a minute, I mean. Like, no, wait. How fast would that be going? I don't Every know, but, minute. But it, it, it's a lot of clicks. Let's just leave it at that. It, it, it's a lot of clicks to get it done because you have to click the card, choose cycle, and then you have to click through for you have to click through the effects to draw the card. You have to click the land that you're untapping. Then you have to tap the land. Then you have to cycle the next card. Then you have to cycle the next card. Da, 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 da. So it's... It's it's a lot of clicking. It's like it's like playing eggs on Midgo. Yeah, it, it's like in that time frame, you've cycled through, you know, in a minute, let's say, you cycle through like twenty cards, redraw those twenty cards, and cycle through them, and click through them, and search your library, and shuffle your library. You see where it starts to go from there. Yeah, it's a lot easier in uh, in paper, just li- just like with eggs and high tide and other combo decks like that, where you're drawing a lot of cards, where you can just shortcut it you just say to your opponent look we we both know i'm gonna be, i'm just gonna i'm just gonna be cycling these things i don't need to you know wait for you to respond do i i can just keep going like yeah it's much now, easier in paper <laughs> now i expected that to be the case you know once you start going new perspectives you combo off instantly you can fizzle oh a lot oh yeah you can definitely fizzle um i fizzled like three or four times already and there's nothing you can do about it. Like, you're literally just like, oop, I drew another basic land when I really didn't need to. Yay. <laughs> or, oops, I cycled too many cards at the beginning of the game. Now I don't have a lot of cards in my hand. Or my opponent made me discard a bunch of cards. It's pretty bad. Yeah. Um, no, it also I- becomes much harder when your opponent starts, like, naming cards, like, new perspectives or approach the second sun and exiling them with, like, Lost Legacy. Ooh, it becomes hard. <laughs> oh, yeah, it becomes real tough to win with the deck when that happens. And that definitely is one of the weaknesses of the deck is when it has to go up against Lost Legacy or Hand Disruption. Uh, but one of the things that we see with the deck, and this is kind of the... I guess this would be the biggest debate with the deck, is um, there's one card slot that kind of gets flipped around a lot. And it's whether you play four copies of Sensor or four copies of Renewed Faith. We're seeing that in, in most versions of New Perspectives combo, not every version, there's a four of slot that is occupied by one of these cards. Now, uh, Renewed Faith, it's I think it's two and a white. Instant speed, gain six life, and then you can cycle it for one and a white, and when you cycle it, you gain two. Sensor, it's a big player in the format. It's one and a blue, four spike, and you can cycle it for a blue. And I th- Danny... You and I are both on sensor. We're both on the side of sensor here. Oh yeah, sensor is just so much better because it allows you to play these early game. You're, you're able to go like tap land, untap source, go, and you just feel so much more in control compared to what your opponent's about to deal with, where they're just like, okay, well this could be a sensor, I guess. Like when when you're playing against sensor, it's annoying. When you have, you know, renewed faith. Your opponent laughs at you because six life means nothing for three mana. 
yeah, it, it's it's not a whole lot of a gain. And during the combo, gaining two life here and there usually isn't that much. And one of the powers of sensor is it's, it's the same power that other soft counters like Force Spike and Mana League have, where when you force your opponent to play around it, the card is gaining so much more value than it normally does. Because it's not just countering the spell that you end up targeting with it eventually. It's effectively countering the spell every turn before that. It's it's almost like you're remanding the spell every single turn, but you're not having to spend mana. And uh, one of the biggest things the sensor has always been, when it becomes bad, you cycle it. And here, you can do that. And then also, it's a it's a component of your combo so it's it's an incredibly strong card and i think you and i we both agree it's much better than renewed faith in this slot i mean i don't mm-hmm. i don't fault those of you who are playing renewed faith in your lists but sensor is just incredibly strong right now i i 100 recommend trying out sensor um and i think that you won't regret it if you take out what did we do we took out like two of the Shadows of Inishrod land, the the green white, you know, check land. Yeah, we, we took put out in. Yeah, we took out um the fortified villages, and then um one other card, and we swapped them for botanical sanctums to get you that blue mana early, which uh, allows you to more e- to more reliably cast sensor on turn two, turn three, turn four, which is when they're important for this deck. Yeah, exactly, and it, it's really all about. You know, making sure your green and your blue mana is untapped, it's much better that way. Because, like, even like even early, like early in the game, your opponent's going to play around sensor. We'll just cycle it. Mm-hmm. It's and also then, one mana, not yeah. two. And then you can really mess with your opponent by turn one botanical sanctum, and then you cycle the, the sensor. And now your opponent's thinking, well, if you cycled that sensor on turn one, does that mean he still has a sensor in hand? Sensor is a very annoying card to play around. It oh. really changed standard to, for the better. Um, I do wish that there were better control decks in the top eight of the uh, Pro Tour, but there were zero. But now that the Pro Tour is over, control will start to reclaim its place. Mm-hmm. And we're going to get to control in a minute, but first we have another aggro deck to cover. And this one, it, it didn't do so hot at the Pro Tour, but I think it still has a lot of potential, and this is Red White Humans. Yeah, um, and I think the reason why is just because Zombies was just better. Yeah, Zombies really was just the better deck. It has a lot more resiliency. Um, I mean, that's really it. It just has a lot more resiliency. It has a better plan B, whereas Humans is just bash face, bash face, bash face. Mm-hmm. And... One of the things that's actually helping with that strategy for humans is the new Glory Bound Initiate. You know, it's a two mana three one, and then you can exert him to make him a four four life linker. But one of the biggest things about this deck is that it can abuse exert with always watching. Always watching is is still such a really powerful card. You know, three mana non non token creatures get plus one plus one and vigilance. Vigilance and Exert is is, yeah, go, I, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's insane. So you know, imagine Glorybringer having Vigilance. Imagine Glorybound with Vigilance as well. These cards don't deserve Vigilance. There's a reason why they have Exert. Yeah, uh, they're, they're supposed to get the effect, and then you have to wait a whole another turn. But when they have Vigilance, all Exert says is. It does not untap your next turn. Well, guess what? It's not tapped anyways, so you get to attack and exert with it again the next turn. Now, it is important to make sure that you do clarify that a card is exerted and it does have to be triggered, and it does have to specify that it is exerted, because if your opponent finds a way to tap the creature, it will not untap on its untap set. But, besides the point, um, I think a lot of pros miss that anyways, but whatever. It's still fairly... That's... That's annoying, man. That card is... Always Watching was a card that we kind of overlooked, and we just like looked at Exert, and we were like, eh, whatever. And then Always Watching was just like, Hey, guys. Hey. I'm over here. It's like, oh, I forgot. 
<laughs> yeah. Um, and, and one of the things that helps with uh, this is always watching. You can get like half an always watching with two different cards that can be played in a deck. You've got Thalia's Lieutenant, which is always good in humans' decks. When it enters, your other humans get plus and plus encounters. When you play another human, it gets a plus and plus encounter. So it's kind of like uh, it's kind of like half and always watching when you play him because you can play, you know, turn one expedition envoy, turn two glory bound initiate, turn three Thalia's lieutenant, and you st- it's almost like you played an always watching on turn three. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you have honored crop captain, which also serves the same role: attacking creatures get plus one plus zero. Oh. So, you know, it, it, again, it's almost like playing always watching on turn three but not quite. And both these are powerful cards to turn up the pressure. Then uh, the closest thing humans has like a recursion engine is with Devoted Crop Mate, which is a three drop that when you exert him, you can return a two drop from your graveyard to the battlefield. So like it's the closest thing to recursion they have similar to zombies. So you can like exert your Devoted Crop Mate, get back your Thalia's Lieutenant, buff your team, like little things like that. Yeah, it's you know, on our cro- uh, devoted crop mate. My apologies, devoted was it's a mini sun titan. It's a little one. Yeah, it, it's it's kind of like um, renegade rallier. People were super excited about renegade rallier being able to do uh, being able to do recursion shenanigans. But I mean, the biggest thing of devoted crop mate is you get it every single turn if you have always watching out, or every other turn if you don't, and that was one of the problems with Renegade Rallyer, in standard at least. It's it's a one off effect, so you you get one thing back, and that's it. End of story. Which, eh? But then yeah, always watching, and it's good. Yeah, now it's good when you get to do it every single turn. You bring back a uh, Thalia's Lieutenant every single turn, like that is strong. Then you've got your backup plan of Ormondal, which is just great in any go wide deck. I mean Ormond. Ormondal saw some play in the Zombies decks. It is in this deck. It, it, it sees play in every single deck that makes use of tokens or go wide strategies just because it's a great way to counter a board wipe or if your opponent ends up with this just gummed up board of like Ishkana and stuff like that. There needs to be more evasion with the deck. It, it needs to go under, not over or wide. It needs to go under. And I don't know any cards that do that right now. Yeah, there really aren't very many cards that do that um, in the format. Uh, I mean, it would be nice if we had little things like that, you know, give this guy, like, give guys flying. I mean, we do have uh, Odric Lunark Marshall. Maybe you end up with some builds playing, like, two or three of him, and then you have, like, some dudes with flying to give everything flying, but that may be going a bit too deep. Uh, But, you know, little things like that. Who knows? There's probably some innovation left in this deck. Um, But it it is really cool to see other flavors of aggro out there for those who want it. Well, one card that we did forget to mention, actually, was the Bloodlust Initiate. Initiator? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, Bloodlust Insider. Insider. Yeah, that guy. We we did mention him in uh, in our episode on cards that you may have underestimated. I don't remember what we called the episode, but um, we did mention him. He is also pretty strong in this deck. Um, you're right, because you play him, you can play him turn one, and then turn two, you glory bound initiate or honor crop captain. Give that haste and swing, and then play your three drop, give that haste and swing. Mm-hmm. And yeah, like, yeah, exactly. Like he He's doing in this deck pretty much what we what we outlined in that episode. Yeah. He's literally a very unexpected card. I think he's like a two or a three of, maybe even a four of. You play him turn one, and he just gives things haste. And then occasionally, he gets in. And he's a human as well, so he gets buffed by Thalia's Lieutenant. He buffs Thalia's Lieutenant late game. They just have lots of fun together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the card's pretty cool. Like, there's a lot of little nuances with the deck. Is it the best? It's definitely close to tier one. Uh, it's one and a half range. Uh, it's it's close. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd give it about tier one point five, maybe tier one point six. You know, maybe not quite one point five, but it's definitely like close. Like if if the right innovations are made, 
uh, and you bring this into the right tournament with with uh, with a metagame that's not expecting it, you could probably blow people out of the water with this deck. I think that this deck is something you'd bring into any tournament that you want, and you will do decently. Um, decent, well, and good are three different terms, of course. You know, that's entirely up to you and how you decipher it. You will top eight with this deck. Let's put it that way. Yeah, there definitely is a good chance of top eighting with this deck. It's it's not it's very aggressive, and uh, it may not have the best backup plan compared to zombies, but you know it, it, it it's going to stay at a good budget level for you know if you want to get into standard right now and you want to play aggro, this is kind of a, one of the decks you can turn to. Yep, exactly, and it's it's perfectly fine. Mm-hmm. I I think the deck is good. I think that people should be playing it, um, and it would keep people from playing Mardu vehicles. That'd be better. <laughs> Yep. Now, uh, the last deck we're going to talk about, at least as far as the uh, meta standard decks go, we have Blue Control. So this is encapsulating all Blue Control decks. That's Blue, Blue White, Blue Red, Jeskai, whatever combination you want. Yeah. Um, they're Sadly, they didn't do very well at the Pro Tour, and that's something I really wanted to, to happen was a good control deck to make it into the top eight. Um, sadly, nothing got in there because Zombies is very, very powerful, and same with um, Marble. Um, a good disallow stops Marble most of the time anyways. Besides the point, um, it's it's a very good place to be as a control-style deck, I think. Um, there's a lot of variations. There's Mono Blue, Blue White, Blue Red, just Blue Black actually now, Grixis, uh, Jess guy, there's even I think like a bad control list that's going around. Maybe like there's just a lot of good little decks that are coming from control, but it's all blue based. Torrential Gear Hulk is the big swinger in this deck. Yeah, Torrential Gear Hulk, uh, commit to memory in a few lists, and then you've even got pull from tomorrow. So uh, this deck it, it is very similar to the ones we were seeing at the onset of this new standard. Um, but most of them are cutting Dynavolt Towers. You're not really seeing that plan going on so much anymore. Uh, you're more seeing just grind out your opponent with counter spells, and then eventually Torrential Gear Hulk on their turn, flashback memory, redraw up to seven, and just you know keep that Torrential Gear Hulk protected. And that's kind of been the ga- that's kind of the game plan you see from a lot of these a lot of these decks, and. Uh, very uh, just like we were talking about at the beginning of this format, Essence Scatter is kind of the glue that helps keep this deck together. Now, it's only seeing play as a 2 of or 3 of in most lists, but it helps the viability of the deck a lot, because Essence Scatter in the current standard is good at every single point in the game. Especially when the only deck that doesn't stop is the New Perspectives decks, but you run you know, negate main board sometimes, and you also run disallow and other things like that, so you don't care. But when it's a creature-based format, oh man, Essence Scatter is insane. And then you have, like, Sensor as a backup card? Ooh, doggy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's real good for it. Now, uh, as, you, as, uh, as you mentioned, as I said at the beginning, there are all the different flavors, and each of them has their own benefits. Uh, you've got the mono-blue versions, which it allows you to run Engulf the Shores, uh, very nice board wipe, extremely effective versus zombies, um, because you get to wipe their board without filling up their graveyard to fuel their Diagraph Colossus. That's really strong. You kill a bunch of tokens at the same time, which is great. And uh, then you even have a few blue-white versions that are only barely splashing white so they can still play Engulf the Shore, you know, using lands like the uh, like the new blue-white cycling land, or a prairie stream, so that their white sources are still islands and stuff like that. Yeah, um, those versions I've thought about testing them because I played the mono blue version as well. Mm-hmm. Um, it becomes weird because, like, sure, out um, cast out is good, and your sideboard becomes a little better with a little more white, you know, in there, but it doesn't feel correct. It, it, it feels like you're really forcing something that doesn't need to be forced, hence why you you would just play blue-white, or you'd play just Jeskai. Yeah, like that is definitely is one of the weak points of the, of the 
blue splashing white control deck is it's just you know you are splashing white for some powerful things but it's just like how worth it is that you know ruining the consistency of your deck just a tiny bit you know you you don't have as many untapped sources early to play a turn two essence scatter or a turn two sensor or anything like that yeah and it matters it it, it catches up to you eventually i promise then we just have uh the blue white versions which you know, go all in on being two color. You've got your cast outs, fumigates, a uh, few lists playing Gideon of the Trials. Even we did discuss that a little bit. Um, and then we've got you know your spell quellers, and some versions even playing a Thalia's Lancers and Brazella package. So you've got your Thalia's Lancer uh, fetches up the Gisela or the Bruna. Your Gisela's give you some early game pressure against the opponent, as well as blocking a lot of things very well. And then Bruna just turns on that little, uh, what's it meld. called? The the little flip combo that they have. Meld. Yeah, meld, that thing. Yeah, so you turn that on, and now your opponent's removal is all useless and all, everything. So it, it, it's, it's for interesting. Cast out. Except for cast out. But we're not seeing a lot of cast out being played yet. That's true. Yeah, I can see the point of doing that. Like, I don't know. I, like, as soon as you said the bris- the you know, the, the little meld mechanic, I was like, cast out. Like, <laughs> instantly just, bam, cast out. Yeah, done. Ca- like, or commit. Commit stops that, like, oh. non-stop. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean Brise- the Brazella package is one that I would take out in the uh, control mirror. It's not going to be very useful in that. Uh, I would much rather use uh, something else to break that mirror. But uh, we, we do have a couple other versions. We have, like, the blue-red version that you mentioned. This uh, You get to play your glory bringers against mid-range decks. You get to play your Harness Lightning, which is always a good removal spell. We've even got Brutal Expulsion, which is seeing a nice amount of one-of play in a lot of lists, uh, just because it's like having Commit and Magma Spray tied together in one card. It's pretty nice. (laughs) Yeah, it's really nice because you can use it against vehicles, and and you go Bounce Your Heart of Kirin, and Magma Spray, your Scrap Heap Scrounger. You can use it against zombies and go bounce your Diagraph Colossus, Magma Spray your Crypt Breaker, or Magma Spray your Dread Wanderer. Like, it's, it's really nice, that card. Yeah, and it, it's cool. I'm glad to see that that card's actually seeing some play. Like, I thought that card was very, very cool when it first came out. It's very difficult to be useful. But, you know, if I, everything finds a home eventually, either that or in the you know, one dollar bear package area. <laughs> yep, we find it in the uh, one, one of the shops in our area has a uh, bulk rare vending machine, and may, and you know you'll find you know weird rares in that sometimes. I, I like to throw a couple bucks in there every so often, find some janky cards for commander. But um, we'll get into that another day. Yep. <laughs> uh, we have one last thing to talk about with the blue control decks, and that is the mirror breaker that we see in some sideboards. We're seeing Sphinx of the Final Word seeing play. I play it in main board in the new Perspectives combo deck, um, but Sphinx of the Final Word is insane right now. Yeah, it's really good if you expect Control to be in your meta, and the biggest reason why is against Control decks, The o- literally the only way he can be answered is if your opponent has Commit to Memory in their hand right then, or if they can Torrential Gear Hulk Commit to Memory. And it's like... It, it makes it really tough for Control to deal with them because it, it's literally only those three to four cards in their deck. They have to have it right then. And then for the rest of the game, you win every counter war. Yeah. Like, you don't even just... Like, your opponent can't do anything. You really can't respond. The card's insane. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's it's really good in the mirror. It's really good against Control decks for other decks as... As you said, new perspective combo, we're seeing lists playing that because against control decks, you just, during the combo, in the middle of it, you're just like, hey, and here's Sphinx of the Final Word. It resolved? Good. I'm going to keep going. <laughs> like, Yeah. Oh, wait. Now everything will resolve. Oops. Yep. So, uh, definitely a great card. I'm very happy that card found a home, too. I mean, I mean, that's kind of the story of the blue-red control deck. It gave two rares a home. In standard. Yeah, it's good. Everybody deserves a home. Including you, Janky Rare. You deserve it. Yep. Now, before we leave you today, 
we do have our brew of the week. And this one's a spicy one that I came up with yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, quite I, literally. Quite literally, the day before we sat down to record, I came up with this deck. I sent it to Danny last night. And uh, <laughs> um, so before I say what the deck is, I want to talk about how I came up with this. So uh, I was I was looking through a lot of places online, looking at, you know, just looking for the jankiest brews. And I do this from time to time and just go like, hey, that's funny. I don't think that'll ever work. But um, eventually uh, I started thinking, okay, now how could I beat Etherworks Marvel? Hand disruption. What hand disruption is there in standard? We've got Lay Bear the Heart. We've got Transgress the Mind. And we've got Harsh Scrutiny, which is kind of like the hand disruption that's so bad you don't want to play it in Limited. But for the same reasons that Essence Scatter is good in Standard, I think Harsh Scrutiny is good in Standard. It's a single black mana, you rip a creature from their hand, and you scry one. So, it's really good that way. So, yeah. so I wanted a deck that played all three of these. <laughs> um, so, you know, I'm, I'm going into black, and then I'm like, okay, what else can I use for hand disruption? Oh, Thought Not Seer. That card has not seen Standard play in a long time. So today we bring you Mono Black Eldrassi. It's funny. This is how Bruce start. Or they die. Because you <laughs> take two cards and you're like, kiss. Wait. <laughs> they don't work. <laughs> I've, I've been testing this deck here and there. Uh, it's, got, it's got some nice starts. Um, one of the things that helps it out is uh, it does play four Hedron Crawlers and two Corrupted Graph Stones. So... Um, the Corrupted Graph Stones, it's kind of the worst Hedron Crawler in this deck. I mean, Hedron Crawler, 90% of the time, he's going to survive to your turn three. Most people won't bother killing him. Maybe eventually, you know, if you go up against someone that really knows what they're doing, they might, you know, go, oh, bolt the bird. I got to kill that now with a Fatal Push. But they feel bad about using Fatal Push on a Hedron Crawler, so maybe they won't. Who knows? Right. Um,. Then you have your Corrupted Graph Stones, and that occasionally can net you a mana. You need to you need to have one of your black, non-devoid cards in the graveyard for it to work because of the wording of Corrupted Graph Stone. It adds a color to your mana pool of a card in your graveyard, but devoid cards don't have a color, so you can't add with those. Uh, really, so really good if you have like an opening hand of Harsh Scrutiny into Corrupted Graph Stone. Now the reason it plays these cards is so you can play Thought Nuts here in turn three and be your best imitation of modern Eldrazi Stompy. And Thought Nuts here on turn 3 is incredibly powerful in standard, it's just, you know, there's not not a lot of ways to do it uh, consistently. So, I've been trying it out, and I've been getting it often enough that I'm confident in this deck. Um, One of the powers of Mono Black is, you know, you get to play Fatal Push, Grasp of Darkness, and... um, Hand Disruption. So we've got all the Hand Disruption, uh, four Harsh Scrutiny, three Lay Bear the Heart, uh, two Transgress the Mind. Uh, now one of the downsides of Lay Bear the Heart, card has to be non-legendary, so you can't grab Etherworks Marvel with it, but you can grab everything else. You can turn to Lay Bear the Heart and take away their Rogue Refiner, so now it's much harder for them to get the six energy, and they don't draw their card, or something like that. So it... it, mm-hmm. it Works very well within the deck like that. Uh, we got some matter reshapers, which is going to help out with the uh, curve because you can turn three matter reshaper. It blocks a lot of stuff in the format right now very well, and it, it, it's one of the powers of matter reshapers. You don't care if it dies because it dies and you gain value. You either draw a card or you play, or you put a land or a mana source into play. I mean, you always put a mana source into play or draw a card with this deck, with Matter Reshaper, because all your permanents, all, all your non-land permanents that cost two or less are mana sources. So it, it works out very well, like that. Um, then we have, to finish out the deck, we've got three Reality Smashers and an Endbringer. So... Reality Smasher, just an incredibly powerful card. 5-5, five, five, Haste Trample. Like, on a good day, this deck plays it on turn 4. And you just start winning games off of that. It's hard to stop that. Oh yeah, it's very hard. Especially because your opponent has to discard a card 
as well as use their removal spell to kill it. Yeah, especially in the world of fatal pushes and really that's it when it comes to removal that's like strictly um Yeah, and, and this guy dodges situational. Yeah, and this guy dodges fatal push all the time because he's a five drop. Like yeah. it it's really good. And then uh the Endbringer is in the deck mostly because uh Endbringer is another way to answer Ulamogs. It's a good way to answer Gideon's it's a good way to answer um, Heart of Kirin's big Diagraph Colossi because you just, on their turn, you pay one mana, tap it, target creature can't attack or block. Hey. And then on your turn, you just go, well, I'll draw a card or I'll ping you for one with this guy. And he's really good against those big threats that you can't remove in this deck. And that's one of the downsides of the deck is Fatal Push and Grasp of Darkness is your only removal it, it, it's hard to kill a good number of creatures in the format. Like there, there's a number of creatures in the format that you just can't kill with those spells. So Endbringer kind of ties up those loose ends. Now, one inclusion I have in the land base, and this is one that um, I was including in in Black X decks from when it came out is Blighted Fen. Uh, Blight of Fen is, is incredibly strong. Uh, at the time, I was playing it because of Emrakul the Promised End. But now it's really good against Ulamog as well because it's a land that you sacrifice to force your opponent to sacrifice a creature. So it, it, at, at the low, low cost of three of your lands, their Otherworks Marvel did nothing because, you know, they hit Ulamog, they target two of your two of your lands... You float the mana, Ulamog resolves, and then you go sack blighted Fen. You have to sacrifice him because you've killed their uh, you've killed their servant of the conduits and their rogue refiners with your other removal spells or with combat and all that. So it, it, it's something that really helps out against the Marvel decks, especially. Yeah, I mean, occasionally your opponent will force you know target the blight defend, which is also not bad for you. Like if your opponent's targeting blight defend, that's a good thing. No, yeah, if your opponent's targeting blight defend, that's great. Um, I'd rather him target that than one of my swamps that I need to cast my <laughs> my uh, hand disruption. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, there's, I mean, the deck's got some really cool things that are going on here. I definitely like it a lot. Uh, I think it's a, a budget friendly deck right now. Like, Thought on Seer, Reality Smasher, uh, Matter of Shaper, even um, Endbringer. These cards are going to increase in price over time as they are rotated out. Um, because of the modern legacy and vintage, pick them up. The cards are great. Yeah, this is really cool. And now, um, as with all the brews, I do have a tentative sideboard here. Uh, I'm going to go over my choices for the sideboard really quick uh, before we leave this week. Uh, we've got Dispossess. Uh, pretty obvious why that's there. Otherworks Marvel. Uh, you can also s- kind of use it against vehicles. You know, it's the same way we've been seeing um, the Zombies deck using Dispossess. Uh, we've got a second Endbringer here, and that's, again, for the Marvel decks, for the Vehicles decks, for the Zombie decks, you bring this guy in because he stops their big things that you can't kill otherwise. Uh, you've got some Never to Returns, that's for Vehicles, for, uh, there's a four-color Planeswalkers list going around that, like, Ross Miriam just did an article on, so, uh, you might end up seeing that. It's a really good card against them. Uh, you've got some Scarab Feast that's going to help you out a lot against zombies. It's going to you know shrink their Diagraph Colossus. It's going to get rid of Scrap Heap Scroungers and Dread Wanderers. Uh, we've got three to the Slaughters, and that's going to be really good against the uh, Marvel decks. Just like Blighted Fen is, it, it's kind of going to be extra copies of Blighted Fen against them because um, you you know force them to sacrifice their Ulamog, and then uh, the Delirium doesn't really matter too much against a lot of decks you're going to be bringing that in against, so it, it's just an instant speed edict, is why you're playing it. Uh, edicts got, are good. Yeah, edicts are really good. I actually was waffling over what edict to put in that slot. Uh, I almost thought of Trial of Ambition just because it's a two-drop, so you can... They turn four Ulamog, you go in, exile two of your lands, okay, they're like, okay, well I didn't draw a land, I'll just play Trial of Ambition. <laughs> She's the jank is strong with you today. Yeah, um, so that, that that was one of the ideas for the slot. I ended up with two of the slaughter because if you're against Marvel, you're you're gonna you're gonna be wanting to leave out that mana to kill uh, the Ulamog if you can. Um, then 
we got two walking ballistas, and that's mostly for the aggro decks. Kills Dread Wanderers. It kills Glorybound Initiates. It kills Bloodless Insiders. Kills Stalag's Lieutenants. All that stuff. So it, it, it's pretty strong against them, and it gives you a big threat late in the game. And and the spiciest thing, which Danny, I, I specifically messaged you about this after I sent you the deck list, is two Visions of Brutality. Oh, Visions. So Visions of Brutality saw a little bit of play in the black-red uh, aggro deck in Battle for Zendikar Limited. Has not seen standard play. But uh, it, it, it's an interesting enchantment. It's, it's one in a black... You enchant a creature, and that creature can't block. And then whenever that creature deals damage, its controller loses that much life. So, imagine this. Your opponent hits Ulamog, and they go, Exile your Thought Not Seer, and a land, and you can keep your reality smasher because I'm going to block that next turn anyways. And you're like, sure. And then you go, your turn. Visions of Brutality on your Ulamog. Attack with Reality Smasher. Oh, look, you can't block it. You take five. Then your opponent goes to swing in with Ulamog. And you go, okay, I'll exile the top 20 cards of my library. Block with Hedron Crawler. You take 10. Yeah. <laughs> in the perfect world, that happens. In the perfect world, that happens. But uh, Visions of Brutality does turn your opponent's Ulamog attacking into a real cost for them. Because... And you could use this for any card, though. Oh, yeah, you can use this on anything. You can use this on Glorybringers. You can use this on Archangel Avacyn. You can use this on uh, a giant Diagraph Colossus. I mean, the same decks you're going to be bringing in Endbringer, the second Endbringer against are the decks that you're going to want this vi- these Visions of Brutalities against. They serve similar purposes. They make it extremely difficult for your opponent to attack with their big bomby dude. It's a Black Pacify. Yeah, it's like a black pacifism. And then the, the, the can't block thing is very good for you as well because your main way of winning with this deck is Reality Smasher beatdowns. So it helps open up the doors for Reality Smashers, gets the big dudes out of the way, while also punishing them for attacking you. I like it. Yeah, it, it's it's definitely the spiciest part of the list. Uh, um, uh, I, I will admit I am a bit proud of it. <laughs> but... Um, as I said, I have been testing this list, and so far, it, it does okay. It's not the best deck right th- right now. Uh, it could definitely use some tweaking. Maybe you play a third Corrupted Grafstone, you go up to seven um, mana sources on two. Maybe you splash green so that you can play you can play uh, a Tune with Ether and Naga Vitalist, so you have even more uh, two mana mana sources. So, who knows? There's a lot of different ways you can take this deck. Um, and it's definitely an archetype that I will be excited if it starts showing up at, like, FNMs and everything, and then starts getting some attention. Maybe you see it at an SCG event. It's going to be really cool. I think this is an archetype that's not very well explored, and should be. Yeah, I think it's something that should be explored. I, I, I definitely agree with you. Alright, so that about does it for this week. Um, and that's... That does it for our examination of the Amonkhet meta. Now, as the weeks go on, we will come back to this here and there in our episodes and say, you know, if a new deck comes out, we'll make sure to be talking about it. Uh, If the meta changes and that changes how you should be brewing your decks, we'll make sure to cover that as well. If you want to keep up with our episodes, make sure to subscribe to us on iTunes, subscribe to us on SoundCloud, like, subscribe, and share on YouTube. And if you need to get in touch with us in between episodes, you can always find us on Twitter at WizBrewCast or email us at WizardsBrewCast at gmail.com. Danny and I will have our Twitters in the description, and we'll see you guys next week. All right, guys. Have fun.